So this morning, we're going to continue the series. If you guys will put the title screen up there. The series is, oh, it's hard to see. We are in a battle. How many know that we're in a battle? We're in a battle. And you remember I read the scripture in 2 Peter's a few weeks back where Paul said, hey, I know most of you guys already know this stuff. In fact, you're very knowledgeable and learned in it. But I still need to remind you. It's part of my job to remind you, to put us all me included in remembrance of certain things. Sometimes we learn the basics and then we go on, but if we're honest, we're not really practicing them. So I would have you do this. As I speak today, I want you to not be asking yourself, have I heard this sermon before? Did he already talk about this? What I want you to ask yourself is, am I putting this into practice? Am I living it out every day? Me included. It's something that I try to ask myself, Brother Roy, every day. Lord, help me not to be a doer. A doer that's not hearing. And see, because we can do a bunch of stuff, but if we're not hearing God, it's just a bunch of stuff. And Lord, help me not to be just a hearer that doesn't do. We need to be hearers that do. Amen? We're in a war. And the title screen again, don't take it down yet, brother. The t- what Satan doesn't want you to know. There's a bunch of stuff that Satan doesn't want us to know. As we begin to talk, I want to first and foremost, if you would put up Romans 8.31, remind us of something. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's say that statement together. Come on. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? So the question is, is God for us? And I began to ponder this a little this week. And and look what we see in 1 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some are, okay, but is long-suffering toward us, and he's not willing that any. How many is any? It's all. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice it doesn't say that all should be saved. It says that all should come to repentance. What he wants us to do is realize, Andrew, that we're sinners, that we have broken his law, and that we deserve hell. Deserve hell. That's what we've earned. But when we come to realize that truly in our heart and what he's done, it should bring us to a place of repentance where we're not just saying a little prayer, but we're truly wanting to change and live for him, turn from our old ways. Amen? And be repentant and live. He's not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish. Secondly, Romans 5, 8, the Bible says, and you've heard me say many times, he didn't just talk the talk, but he demonstrated it. The Lord, the next scripture. You don't have Romans 5, 8 up there? Oh, I must have missed it. It says he demonstrated his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. Amen? He, he, he's for us, guys. And thirdly, Romans 8, 38 and 39, there's nothing you and I could ever do to get away from his love. For I'm persuaded... That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What I want us to see is, first and foremost, our God is for us. He's not trying to send us to hell. 
He's trying to woo us, to draw us into relationship with him and then be with us for all eternity in heaven. That's what God wants. He does not. It says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's not his heart to send us to hell. It's heart. And what he demonstrates every day is that he loves us and he wants us to be with him for all eternity. So as we start through this second sermon of the series, I don't want you to think for one second that I'm trying to deify or exalt Satan or make us afraid of Satan. Not for a second. The Bible tells us that if you're a child of the Most High God, that you have power over all the darkness. Doesn't mean we know how to use it. Doesn't mean we're tapped into it, but it's available to all of us. One day as I was seeking the Lord, God gave me something that just blew my mind. And sometimes we can skip over this scripture, but look at Revelations 21 to 3. Look at what it says. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him with a, for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit and he shut him up and set a seal on him so that there, he shouldn't deceive. Listen, one lone angel comes and grabs Satan and binds him and throws him in the pit. We want to be careful not to give him more place than we should. At the same time, the Bible tells us that we need to be aware of his schemes. We don't need to be afraid of him. Listen, we fear God, not Satan. We reverently awe our Father, not Satan. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware of his schemes. We shouldn't be aware of his schemes. Listen, I'm not afraid of a mouse, but how many know I'm aware of their schemes so they don't get into my home or get into the motor home and chew the wiring or make big nests, amen, and cause huge problems. I I have to be aware of Satan's schemes. That's what the Bible tells us. Paul in 2 Corinthians 2.11, look what he says. So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So what is it that Satan doesn't want J.D. to know? That he doesn't want Vicky to know? Number one, Satan is our enemy. The world's way of thinking. The movies out that are, that are not godly, the music, the junk, amen? Satan and his worldly way of thinking is our enemy. Satan doesn't want you to know it. He doesn't want you to think of it that way. But ultimately what he's trying to do, listen, is mess with us mentally, emotionally. He's trying to kill us. He's trying to destroy us. He's trying to steal from us. That's what the Bible says. Look at John 10.10. 10. The thief. Who's the thief? Satan. 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 It says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Satan has come to steal and kill and destroy us. Satan is fully evil, and he's a hater of all that is good and righteous. He hates God, and he hates us. And his ultimate goal is to steal, kill, and destroy us and our families. I truly believe if we could get an understanding of this the way Father wants us to, we would be much more reluctant to give him place in our lives. I was going to use a different illustration. I've used this one in the past, but it's such a good one I had to anyway. Um, Back years ago, before I knew the Lord, I watched a movie that I don't recommend, but it had Michael Keaton in it. And he was the worst kind of predator, a serial predator. 
he would move in next to a family that had wealth or affluence. And then what he would do is he would befriend them and get to know them. And then he would rob all of their wealth and he would kill the entire family, and he would do it in such a way that there was absolutely no way they could trace it back to him. The worst kind of predator. He was horrible, awful, and that is who Satan is. He wants to befriend you. He wants to come and cuddle up to you. He wants to get you to watch a movie that's right on the border Because he knows if he can get a hook in, he can get another hook in and get another hook in. And ultimately, he can get a foothold and start to build a stronghold. Amen? We got to be careful. We need to think of him as who he is. If you knew there was a serial murderer that was ultimately out to do nothing but kill you, Take everything you have just so he could get at your family and do the same. Would you give him one inch of your time? Would you let him over and and try to invite him in and make buddies? Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about being unloving or ungodly to people, even if they're horrible. That's not what I'm saying. Would you invite him in and give him place in your home? Would you start opening up your finances to him and showing him stuff? Never. And yet we do it with the enemy every day. Because we don't think of him the way we should. He is evil, incarnate, and his heart is to do nothing but kill and steal and destroy us. And we need to think of him that way. The Bible says he's an enemy of the cross, an enemy of the cross. Secondly, we need to realize, number two, that he is a deceiver. Point number two. He's the deceiver. And he's the father of lies. The father of lies. Romans 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. None. Zero. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. You ever been around somebody that just seems like everything that comes out of their mouth is a lie? I have. I have. You know how to tell when John's lying? His mouth's moving. There are people like that, unfortunately, that just you can't trust anything. Not this John, obviously. Right. <laughs> What I'm saying is we've all been around people that lie more than they tell the truth. It's, and, and they've just made it a way of life and they've cheated and stole. And amen, they're just horrible and deceptive. There is no truth in him. He's the father of lies. That's what it says. Our God is full of truth and he's the father of life. But the enemy is a liar. And the father of lies. And there's no truth in him. That's what it says. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, he says, I'm concerned that you'll be deceived by Satan just like he deceived Eve. And 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen tells us that he will try to deceive us as an angel of light. Just like the man in the movie. He'll buddy up to you. He'll come across as a, he cares for you and cares for your family. But it, inwardly, all he's trying to do is kill, steal, and destroy. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven, thirteen, and 14. It says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder... For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. The young people refer to this as a poser. A poser. A poser. And Jesus in Matthew 17 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Let me ask you a question. Does this mean that we could hear stuff even on Christian television? Even on Christian TV? That's 
not actually from God? That's what it means. We've got to be careful, especially as we get closer and closer to the end. Because the enemy is going to come and he is going to try his best to deceive us as Christians. I don't need to be afraid of it, but I do need to be aware of it. And I need to make my kids aware of it and their kids aware of it. Amen? That's what it says. Jesus told us in Matthew 24, referring to the end times. He said, I'm warning you, pay attention, pay attention. Many are going to come. And he didn't say they might. He said they are going to deceive many. And you know what he said? He said they're going to come and they're going to say, I am the Christ. Now, what's really interesting is if you take that Greek word, we think, oh, they're going to start saying they're Jesus. And there have been people, even in the news just recently, there's some guy saying he's Jesus. But that's not just what he's talking about. The word literally means The anointed. Many are going to come and they're going to be on TV and radio and everything else. And they're going to say, what I'm saying is anointed. It's of God. And they will deceive many. You remember, he can come as an angel of light. And it doesn't say he might. It says he will deceive a whole bunch. So we got to be careful, guys, not to be deceived. Not to be deceived. So how can we win the battle? How can we can avoid how can we avoid being deceived by the enemy? By knowing our Father and His Word. And you've heard me say this time and time again, and you're going to hear it a lot more. The Christian world, notice the blend, would try to tell us that we need to read this book on evolution. Or this book about Muslims, or this book about the occult so that we can gain knowledge about these practices and religions. And I'm trying to tell you, wrong. Warning, 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 warning. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And when the disciples asked what he was talking about, he said, I don't want you to have anything to do with unbiblical doctrine. Stay away from it. He said, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole loaf. Be very careful. He said, be very careful about the Samaritan's teachings. A little leaven. leaven. But pastor, my professor told me that I need to read the Quran so that I can understand Muslims and be able to combat them. He said, I need to read the Book of Mormon and I need to read all about evolution and study it so that I can combat it. I'm telling you, that's not scriptural. I'm telling you, it's not scriptural. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there's not some great sources out there that will help us understand Mormonism, help us understand evolution, the way the world looks at it, but total and completely God-ordained. I'm not saying there aren't some really good books there that will help us understand Muslims. I'm saying be very, very, very careful. Protect your spirit. We can bring that stuff in and it will do more damage by far than good. By far than good. I remember before COVID, I ran across a young man that had been very, very, very evangelistic. He had preached all over the United States. And I met him and I could tell he was dull on the Lord and he did not have the same spirit that he'd had. That he described to me in New York and all over L.A., and he traveled and did all this work. And I talked to him about it. And you know what he told me that was very interesting? He said, I began to read the Koran. I began to read all about evolution. I began to read about Mormons and Jehovah's Witness. And I spent a whole bunch of time studying about all these religions because I knew I was going to run into them on the street. And what he didn't realize, was through taking all that stuff in, it brought in doubt with it. And he had literally become double-minded like James tells us. So he was unsure of himself. 
He didn't know. And he had lost his way. I am saying if you're going to be involved, if God calls you to cult ministry and you're dealing with those kind of things, be very, very careful how you deal with it and what you take into your head and heart. How many know the Bible creates faith in us if we read it and study it and hear it? In the same way, if we take in stuff that's not godly, it can create doubt in us. We need to be careful. We need to guard because the enemy is going to try to deceive us. And that is one of the ways he does it. But praise God, double-mindedness can be cured. The Bible tells us, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And you've heard me refer to this, but I love this illustration. I'm going to use it again. If you had a pond, you know, that got all stagnant, what happens with a pond when water quits flowing? It starts getting gross and stagnant, doesn't it? How do you fix it? That's right. You knock one of the edges off the dike, get some fresh water running into that pond, and that water flowing through that pond naturally begins to kill out the other junk because it can't live where the fresh water is flowing, and it begins to purify itself. Seeing you purify your heart, you double-minded, by obeying the truth. How do we obey the truth? By reading it, studying it, and put it into practice. If you're double-minded, if you let all this junk of the world get in your head and heart, and it's caused you to start to be slack and dull and not moving forward, the good news is just knock the dike out and start filling your head and heart with God's word and being in prayer, which we should be every day, right? And it will create that fresh thing and will create that fresh love start doing what you did before right and it'll come back that's what i want us to realize it doesn't matter listen guys god's more than capable i remember reading a story years ago about the bank tellers and how they were trying to teach them how to recognize counterfeit bills. Now, you, you would think the way that you teach people to recognize a counterfeit bill is you give them counterfeit bills and you say, hey, this is a counterfeit bill. But you know what they did instead? They gave them a whole bunch of real currency. And they said, I want you to feel it and touch it and smell it and just Inundate yourself with these fresh, new bills. And so the moment you pick up one that's not right, what will happen is your senses will say, no, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't smell right. That doesn't look right. There's a little something off there. And we think that we need to read about the garbage in order to deal with the garbage. That's not what the Bible says. It says saturate yourself with God. And when you come in contact with something that's not of him, your spirit will say, no. Let me give you a per perfect example. Do we need to fill our kids' heads with porn in order to teach them to stay away from porn? No. So why do we think we need to study all about Mormonism or all these cults and garbage in order to deal with them? You see, I love one of the guys I watch. He deals with that stuff all the time. But you know what happens when they make a statement? He says, that's not in the Bible. That's not correct. And then they say, well, yes, it is. And he says, show me. And they can't because he knows the word so well. He can take them right to the scriptures that counter what they're trying to say. See, I don't have to study Jehovah's Witness and all their stuff in order to combat it. You hear what I'm saying? I just need to get really good in God's word. And then the Holy Spirit has what it needs to deal with it. You hear what I'm saying? Father's so faithful. Let's not let him deceive us. What we need to do instead is press in. In order to avoid being deceived by the father of lies, Satan, in order to win the battle, we need to learn how to shake him off. 
first of all, again, we need to be in his word and saturate ourselves with him. Secondly, B, we need to learn how to shake him off when he tries to attack. You see, one of the things that happened this week was Satan tried to latch himself on this ministry. Not just by attacking Molly, not just attacking the Swansons. Even this morning when I came in, I know David sensed it too. There was a spirit here. The enemy was trying to mess with all of us and get us to pick at each other and start doing this and doing that. Andrew, you probably sensed it. It's just something he does. He tries to use us all to pick at each other and not be loving or patient or kind. Amen? And it's one of the reasons that before we actually start practicing, what do we do every Sunday, guys? Prayer time. Because you know what? It's easy to walk in and be carrying that junk from the world. And the Bible tells us that we need to sanctify ourselves in the Lord and then be ready. And so we all have learned as Christians, right, Kathy? You might come in with a heavy heart or worries or anxiety or you're a little bit anxious or you're may, maybe just being a turkey. I, hey, I are one sometimes. And we take time before we leave in worship to let go of that and let God fill. Amen? And we all need to do it. In order to avoid him, we need to learn how to shake the enemy off. I've seen this time and time again throughout God's word. And we could mean read several in the Old Testament and New Testament. But I just want to hit a couple. Before we read this, I want to set it up. Paul had just been through a horrible, raging battle with the enemy where the enemy was trying to kill him and everybody on the ship. I'm talking about Malta and that whole thing, right? And the Bible says that Paul got away and got on his knees, and they were all fasting, even the people, all of them that were on the ship. And God spared them all. And they end up on the land. And it's cold. And Paul's starting to build a fire, right? After he's made it through this amazing, miraculous time. Hey, you ever been through a time in the Lord where the enemy's just attacking and you make it through victorious and you get out the other side and you just feel, God, man, he provided financially. He's helped me with health. He's given me wisdom to deal with this situation. Listen, one of the things I found, often when you get to that place where you go, oh, I made it through, watch out. Because he's not done. He's still going to try. And it says he's making a fire. And what happened? All of a sudden, the enemy is a viper in this case. And it jumps out of the fire. And it grabs a hold of Paul's arm. But look what it says he did. But he shook off the creature in the fire. And he suffered no harm. There's a lot of times... When you're doing everything right and you're seeing the victory of God in your life. But listen, you'll come to a place where you feel like, man, I made it through. Beware. Not afraid. Beware. Because the enemy's not done. He's going to still try. And one of the times he tries is when you're at those places of victory. Listen. But what did he do? He didn't freak out. He didn't get all wound up. He didn't give in to fear. He didn't give in to worry and anxiety. He just shook it off and went on. And we see this principle over and over throughout the Bible. Let me give you an example. Look at Matthew 10, 14. Jesus said, And whoever will not receive you, nor hear your hands, when you de- or, or hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. He wasn't saying we need to be mean and rude to people. What he was saying is, I'm sending you out to preach the gospel. And you're going to have some amazing victories. But you're also going to have times when people reject everything you have to say. Learn to just shake it off and go on. We'll go out spreading the gospel, and we have in the past, and there'll be 50 people that fill out things, and they take their tracks and they're very positive, and you might have one or two that scream or cuss at us or flip us off or whatever. How many know pastors just learn to just shake it off? 
we can focus on that one thing. Amen? And it can defeat us. And it's the same way in life. We've got to learn to shake it off. Here's another amazing example. They're preaching the word. They're doing everything God has told them to do. They're having victories. And the Sanhedrin, the, 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 the church drags them in, the Jewish church. And look what happens in Acts 4, 18 and 19. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. He's saying, shake, shake, shake. Shake, shake, shake. People are going to try to stop us from moving forward. And we're going to have times of victory and times where he's still going to try to stop you. Look at Acts 5, 28 and 29. Did we not? This is when they pull them back in. And they've been preaching. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in that name? And look what you've done. You filled all of Jerusalem. Man, you have filled all of Jerusalem with this. And what did Peter say in 29th verse? But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Again, what I'm trying to say is, Guaranteed, somebody slapped Dylan. I know it's hot in here, man. I'm, I'm, I'm about to go to sleep myself, and I'm preaching. <laughs> it's on 72, believe it or not, and it said it was 72 before. But it's all of us bodies, especially when you're like mine and you're a little bigger than normal. I'm saying, you know, it's the radiant heat, right? <laughs> he said, you guys are trying to stop us. You're like that viper, and you've, you're trying to get a hold of my arm. And I'm not going to allow you to stop me. Listen, the enemy's going to try to stop this ministry. I'm telling you, there are a bunch of faithful people here that love the Lord. And you know what? By God's grace alone, we're going to make it through to the end. Whether he comes before it gets horrible or we go through it all and get our heads cut off. Either way, we're going to make it through by his grace. I'm declaring that. Amen? Amen. Together. But it starts, too, with being faithful to his house. And faithful to what he's called us to do every day. And coming together and trying our best. Amen? That's, that's it. And when the enemy tries to stop us every day, whether he tries to get into our relationships and cause problems, or he messes with our finances or our health, part of what we got to learn to do is shake him off. Enemy, you're just trying to stop me. I can't tell you how many times, you know, Molly and I, we go camping in our motor home. And, hey, you want to know how a, the kind of relationship you have, Kevin? Go get in a little 35 by 10 room for four or five days with your wife. You find out what you're made of. And she'll look at me and say, I think you need some quiet time. And you know what? I've learned to go, you're right. Because God gave me this woman that's not afraid. Not afraid. You know why? Because she's learned. If I can keep him close to God, it keeps him close to me. And vice versa, right? We're called to challenge each other to be in Christ and live the way we should. He's faithful. He's going to try. And I'm not trying to tell you for one second to go out and break the laws of the land. Please don't misunderstand me. That's not what I mean by shaking it off. But also, how many know if the laws of the land start coming against the laws of Christ, who wins out? Always God. Always God. Come on, worship team. We might get out here a couple minutes early today. Is everybody okay with that? It's hot. I'm going to go home and turn the AC on. That's already on. Molly says, good. Praise God. Oh, bless you. It's all his glory. Let's not let the enemy deceive us amen. amen listen we're 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 brother roy brother ray we're, we're in the final laps here we've been running a marathon i don't know about you but i feel absolutely blown away that i truly believe i know a lot of people have said hey we're in the last days 
But I'm telling you, you can't look at the signs and not tell we're in the last days. And I praise God because you know what? The Bible says that we're a chosen special people, not just the Jews. We're grafted in. Amen? Amen. The Bible says we have everything Abraham had. There's neither Greek, Jew, female, male, slave, right? We're all his kingdom. We're all the elect. Listen, and God has chosen us for such a time as this. Praise his name. Let's dig in and let's do our best to the end. Let's, amen. Let's fight the good fight.